Welcome to the MuseCast, where we squeeze every last drop of inspiration out of Sunday's sermon. Well, happy Tuesday, Dan Kent. Happy Tuesday, sir. Howdy. How are you doing? I'm I'm all right. I'm here. I'm here. You know what? It's a better Tuesday than last Tuesday because I'm not fresh off of having to rescue a kid from the ditch. So that's right. You know, yes. Things are looking up. The sun is shining, <laughs> and you know, it's a balmy. I don't know, 28 degrees or something. Like that's that's so, great. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know you're jealous, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. That's all you can say. Yeah. Yeah, that's all I'm going to um, say. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that for sure. But I'm checking. Oh, I was wrong. It's 22, but there is a high of 29. There so. you go. Yeah, heat wave's coming. It's coming. It's coming. Uh, happy Tuesday, everyone. Welcome to the MuseCast. Uh, you know him. That's Dan Kent, and I'm Shauna Boren. And we are here to wrap up, if you can believe it or not, to officially wrap up the Sermon on the Mount. So this is the last MuseCast that will deal with the Sermon on the Mount. Can you believe it, Dan? It's been a it's journey, man. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's been a long journey, and uh, I, I didn't think that... Um... Yeah, it's 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 a kind of a big accomplishment. I mean, that we spent a lot of time unpacking that, and um, I, it feels good. And I'm excited. I'm excited to. It's one of those. It's kind of like when you read like a really big book. You know, it's like mm-hmm. uh, on one hand you're like you're relieved and you're glad that it's done, but then you want to get into the next one. So mm-hmm. I, I feel like that's where I'm at. I, I can't wait. We're gonna do a series, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about that later. Uh, that's going to be a topical series, but then we're going to jump into a another uh, Bible text uh, later this spring. So I'm uh, nice. really looking forward to that. Yeah, I would guess, Dan, just how I engage with you and relate to you. I would guess that you are thankful for Summer on the Mount, thankful for all that we've experienced through that. But you're like, you're on to the next, like you are yeah. knee deep in unraveling truth would just be my guess. So yeah, good stuff well, to come, right? Yeah. You know, well, let me just talk about that right now really quick. Uh, first of all, the Sermon on the Mount, I uh, just for my own theological kind of stuff, uh, the Sermon on the Mount is some of my favorite text of the yeah. Bible. So I, I, yeah. I, I could like, if it were up to me, I would just go back to the Beatitudes and start over. I mean, that's like, I love okay. the Sermon on the Mount. Um, okay. But, uh, but yeah, the, you know, my master's degree is in, um, it's a philosophy theology master's degree. So the unraveling the truth series will be kind of in line with my master's degree. So I'm also very excited about that as well. So, uh, yeah. Very nice. Yeah. It's been a wonderful journey. We're going to give it its proper send off. Um, and I, you know, I think we, what we landed on, I think about two and a half years that we've spent in this series, but you, you guys know there were some breaks in there. There were some, some little mini series that we did. And of course we always take a break for Christmas or MLK or just some other things. So, yeah. and some of some subsections of the series tend to go a little longer than we originally thought. So it's interesting. Listen, you guys, we spent like over five years on Luke. So I don't know why anyone was surprised <laughs> with the, yeah. the length of Sermon on the Mount. So mm. this wasn't quite that length. But we did have a panel of which yeah. Dan, Dan is truly going for the M, uh, the MVP award here, you guys, because he's um, working out of state. So he's off location, but he's working very hard. Um, and so not only was he beamed in via Zoom to participate in the panel, but then he was also moderating the chat during the live yeah. stream on YouTube. So, yeah. and he's here today and he's got a summary and we're going to discuss that panel. But the panel was a wrap up and that was you and Greg and Cedric and Emily, folks who yeah. were, were a part of the series throughout the last couple of years. And so you guys got to kind of bring it home for us. And now, Dan, you get to officially bring it home for us with the summary, which I don't know. Is it a is it a plannery? Well, yeah, it's <laughs> like a, yeah, really. It's, what is it's it? Gonna be, it's not going to be an official summary because there is no official sermon. But um, I, I will just to, you know, um, 
I don't know, put myself in proper perspective, I guess. I, I was not technically officially officiating the chat, but it's just so fun to to it interact is. with people on the chat that and you know Cedric and Emily and Greg, they were all talking. So I'm just waiting my turn. So I was kind of checking the chat while I was waiting, you know, for the next time that I was needed. And uh and so yeah, I you know if you are um if you're a social person or if you have ideas or or the sermon uh, compels you to have like a thought, I mean, just, just share it on the YouTube chat. It's uh, it's a good way to kind of connect with people. If you can't be in the church, you can still connect a little Absolutely. bit there. Um, but yeah, so we did this panel and, and it really was sort of a reflection kind of thing where we asked questions like what, what most surprised you and uh, what was the hardest and, and so forth. And you know, it, it's it's really hard to uh, to answer these types of questions with something that that has gone for so long, and there have been so many, I think, really profound and important insights that we've kind of explored over the last two and a half years. And so, I, in thinking back on some of the stuff that I said, at least, I had a recency bias where I was really uh, captured by some of the ideas that I've been wrestling with just in the last six months. Uh, so ideas about the importance of our relationship with God, not just our knowledge of God and, and the fact that God wants to know us. And, you know, I think it's uh seven chapters, you know, Matthew chapter seven. Uh, I don't know which verse it is. I think it's 15 or 20 or something like that, where he says, you know, I, I will say to Jesus says, I will say to them plainly, I never knew you. It's like, well, God is omniscient, so he certainly knows us, but he doesn't know us relationally because that requires us to actually step into that relationship. And just the the centrality of that in the whole Sermon on the Mount uh, is sort of what I was really kind of most reflecting on over the last few months. And that kind of came out in my discussion. But uh, I also, uh, in answering the question, what was most challenging um, I think we all kind of had a similar response where just kind of living some of this stuff out is challenging and it can seem so cliche. Some of these teachings can seem so cliche because they've become so familiar to us and that familiarity can sort of be a stumbling block to seeing the profundity underneath because we assume, well, we know what that's all about and we don't really give it the attention that it, that it requires. Um, and then when you try to live something out, that's when you really see how challenging it really is. And, and it's funny because I just use as an example, just like violence and, and just realizing how violent we are. Um, and just like, for me, like trying not to be violent and even to the point of, you know, trying not to kill spiders, you know, and, and it's funny because people just got so worked up about that. Like, you know, well, that's just a spider. And what about bed bugs and mosquitoes? And it's like, okay, you're missing the point. The, the point isn't about bugs because yeah, we need to protect ourselves from mosquitoes and, and bed bugs and, and stuff like that. The point is the violence in my heart, but it's uh it was pretty hilarious how uh kind of the, the reaction that people had to to that just uh, they 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 don't like bugs apparently, and neither do I. I don't yeah. like spiders especially. <laughs> so, yeah, but, that uh, was crazy. I will say really quickly that that I saw because I was watching the chat at that point. I'm kind of in and out of there, um, and I was watching it. and And the discussion that was going on in the chat was really it brought me right back to when we were in the throes of the series because that's the kind of stuff I felt like we kept getting. Like, well, what about this? And what about like people needing to really like yeah. hone in on specific examples? Of, and it's like, okay, guys, while that is valid and good, maybe let's zoom out and like, this is a heart posture situation. Yeah. This is this is like how we're posturing ourselves. And if you're busy looking for the, oh, but this time it's okay. And this time it's okay. Maybe that's just something that you need to spend some time in with the Lord to say, okay, how is my heart posture? If I'm really digging hard to find a reason why I could be acting yeah. violent um, and it'd be okay. So I just, it just, it took me right yeah. back to the series. It was so interesting. 
Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, that's all right. I, I'm pretty close to done other than it's interesting because last night uh, we were watching. Uh, what were we watching? We were watching Lego Masters. That's what it is. We 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 love the show Lego Masters. And uh, and and we you know, I bought the season so I could just pause it. And then I went in to use the bathroom and I switched the light on. And there was this huge cockroach in the bathroom. And uh, I, and this thing was like uh, like a big kind of like one of those stirring ladles that's how big the the thing was and 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 it had like these feet and it was really fast and i turned the light on and he's like oh my god i gotta get out of here and then uh so he went behind the toilet and so then i'm like well i gotta get this thing and right away i'm like looking for something to squash him with but then i'm like aha aha i am going to try to rescue this guy so then i went and got this tupperware thing and uh and a, a folder so i could you know, clamp them down and slide the folder under. Well, it's interesting because like, as soon as I went around to the side of the toilet, he saw me and then he went dashing under this like vanity thing. So then I had to like move the vanity thing out. And there was like this, you know, kind of, you know, almost like a spy versus spy sort of thing, trying to catch this, this uh, cockroach. And and finally he came out and what, what was just so gross about him is that he had like, like you know these tentacles on his head but they were like hairs they were like these really long hairs but he had like total control over them you know and it was just the weirdest thing you know and and uh and uh, but i got him I, I i put the tupperware over the top of him i slid the folder underneath there and i ran him outside and then uh i brought him like down to the end of the street away from the houses and i i took the tupperware off the folder and i shook the Tupperware, but it was dark out. And so I'm like, well, I, I don't see him anywhere down there. And then I look up and he's still on the Tupperware. And then, so then I just threw the whole, I threw the whole thing up in the air and, and finally he was, he was gone, but it was quite the adventure, you know? Um, and, and as, and as, as troublesome as it was, I got to admit th the bug was big enough where I feel like let doing all of this was less uncomfortable than trying to squish them because with a bug that big, you're going to get the little crunching crackly kind of thing. And it's uh, it just gives you the willies. So um, that was my, uh, my, my most recent bug adventure. I don't know how you did it. I have <laughs> zero love for cockroaches. Like I, yeah. I don't yeah. like, there's no grace or love there for that particular <laughs> creature insect um also i love how you made him very masculine <laughs> and yeah. he, he was a he, yeah, yeah. he was a predator man yeah so, he was wow dan you are just you're so like jesus dan i <laughs> yeah. hope you can <laughs> rub yeah. off on the rest man. of us <laughs> i doubt that i well and and like uh you know it's one of those things too where it's like even while I, i'm doing it i'm like you know I mean, the, the the first thing I thought was like, well, I mean, he's just going to go into somebody else's house now and or uh, he's just going to be um, food for a bird or something, you know, I mean, some which, you know, that's that's cool. At least he's getting some use. I mean, at least a bird will will have yeah. a full stomach, you know, but then I just happened to think, again, it's not really about the bug. It's just about right. just kind of uh, exploring that violence in my heart and and mm -hmm. um and maybe maybe violence i don't have to be violent to solve all, all my problems and and it forces yeah. you to be creative i mean i mean to, to kill the bug i just you know take a boot and smush them you know but i had yeah. to like contrive this whole thing and and there's so many more resources used and and uh so you know i i think there's something to that it's like we will never you know, this the Jeremiah says, peace, peace, they say, but there is no peace. Well, it's because they don't really creatively try for peace. They 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 just immediately do the violent reaction. So they never really learn and they never really tap into the creativity that's required to actually create peaceful outcomes. And uh and my hope is that, you know, the more people kind of explore the violence in their hearts and the more they work at creatively solving their problems without violence, maybe as a society, we will also experience down the road more peace. And I mm -hmm. think that's a good mm -hmm. thing. Absolutely. Um, thank you for that summary slash panel or wrap up. <laughs> that, was, that was good. We've got to coin a phrase for that. 
Anyway, I I find it interesting because as I was reflecting myself on the series, I love well, I too love the Sermon on the Mount. It's one of those where um like you guys said on the panel, you, we kind of we know these verses, we know these themes, but the way that we kept taking a pass through and just diving in and drilling down on some of these verses was really interesting because you begin to see things differently than you've seen mm-hmm. them before. At least that's what happened with me. And I love the the whole, the salt and light. Like if I'm thinking through like some of the subseries, the salt and light, I thought that was really great. I remember a lot of our discussions from Musecast on that. And that's the thing, you and I, we um, are involved with the services in a variety of ways. You are involved like in leading up to it and, you know, the sermon development stuff and, you know, all that kind of things. And then in the chat and stuff, and sometimes uh, taking a couple of the sermons and hosting and all that. And and I'm involved with, you know, being there on Sundays and hosting and uh, all, all of those things. And then we do Musecast and then I do gathering groups. So like we get many passes through a single yeah. sermon. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so it can be challenging to find fresh revelation. Um, and so that was really cool, personally speaking, to to lean into that like challenge of it. Like, what else can I see here? Because because there is usually something to see or maybe just a different right. viewpoint or perspective. So that was really cool. But two, like you guys on the panel said, the hardest part was the nonviolent stuff. And not because I'm addicted to violence per se, although (laughs) when you examine your heart, you go, oh, well, in some areas, maybe I am. Um, It's just, it's hard. It it can be difficult. And I do know that's where we did get a lot of feedback and, um, and pushback, not in a bad way, but just some pushback like, oh, what, you know, and for me, um, I've known our nonviolent stance and then this coming on the heels of our MLK weekend. So this has kind of been fresh top of mind again. I know our nonviolence belief at Woodland Hills. And, um, it's very easy for me to like to zoom out and go, no problem. Cause you know what? Hmm. I'm not in mil- in the military. Um, I'm not in law enforcement. I don't have a particular role in society or a job that would require me to make decisions in which do I act in violence or not to preserve and protect. Or, so those, so I can kind of go, oh, not my issue. And that is a lie from the pit because it is my issue. Why? Because we've talked about how when I go through the carpool line at school, how very quickly yeah. it revealed to me some of my issues right like some of my issues and so i love that we like i keep saying we we kept going at things because things are revealed to you so you know maybe you're not violent in your actions maybe or maybe you are maybe it's your thought process maybe it's how you function in the world maybe it's in the way that you consume food or who or entertainment or you know um enjoyment who knows like there is something there for us all to examine and i think that has been my biggest takeaway is don't assume that i know what the end is going to be because just because i am familiar with a passage like god yeah. has something to say there and um we all have something to consider in regards yeah. to that particular thing amen yeah that's that's good um yeah, I have nothing to add to that. That's uh, that's okay. well said. Well, since we're just going to, uh, I was going to say something terrible. I was going to say beat a dead horse, and that's terrible. That's a terrible <laughs> phrase. Like, it's, why did we do that? <laughs> feed a fed horse. That's what you're supposed to say. Feed a fed oh, horse. Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, we're not going to feed. <laughs> Thank you, Dancy. <laughs> He's like Jesus, folks. He's <laughs> just, you know, he's just yeah. on it. Yeah. Um, there was a question in the chat um, that I think you had kind of started to engage with the panel. So maybe you didn't see it, but it does pertain to this because like we said, there was a lot of chatter that came up when we were talking about this nonviolence piece. And so I just wanted to pose it to you and um, get your thoughts on it. And this person in the chat during the live stream said uh, that he would love to hear thoughts on the violence of the cross. Um, was the violent blood and suffering required? to save all. Yeah. So hmm. give us your answer to that, Dan. Kess. Well, uh, like- yeah, th- there's, yeah, there's different uh, answers to that. Um, 
some people think that if Jesus is our sacrifice, then his blood is required, uh, the the cleansing blood of Christ, where there is the, – since sin is sort of this uh, act of rebellion against God and that that basically is death, then you need some type of death to atone for that and to uh, compensate for that. And so some people will say that the death is a, a big part of it. And 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 since uh, the, the cross was sort of um, part of God's plan, that Christ's sacrifice was part of God's plan, there's this idea that um, – you know, violence is part of God's plan. Um, and, and I don't think that's necessarily the way it has to go. I think that, uh, um, first of all, that holy cow, I'm embarrassed at how dumbed down of an atonement discussion this is, but just to get to the point of the question, uh, I have to, I'll just bypass a lot of stuff, but I, I'll just say this, that, um, I, I think that you can, uh, absolutely agree that the cross is the, the path through which God brings about atonement, um, and that is part of God's salvation plan, without uh, saying that the violence was part of God's plan. I think that you can look at that and say, okay, well, you know, I think First John 3 says that, you know, Christ came or Jesus came to defeat the works of the devil. And, uh, and so, Jesus' whole mission here had to do with defeating the devil. Well, that kind of exposes that there's this conflict between God and Satan. And and so now the question is, okay, why did Jesus suffer and die on the cross? Was it because of something that God did? Well, no, this this looks like something an enemy would do. And sure enough, that's what I would say is that the the violence and, and death on the cross wasn't God doing that. It's something that God had anticipated because God is omniscient and wise and he knows his enemy so well. And of course, this is what the enemy is going to do. But um, it's not something that God had orchestrated. It was absolutely something that uh, Satan had orchestrated. And it was part of, of Satan's plan. And God's plan was to use that against Satan ultimately. And so it's sort of like this, uh, I think Greg, Greg refers to it as divine Aikido, where you use the sin that other people do against them. And so uh, Satan had this plan that God uses against him to bring about atonement and um, ultimately salvation for for his people. So, you know, that's what I would say. And, but the, the other part of that, too, is that, um, you know, we're we're called to to be nonviolent. That is not a na- there's no naive assumption in that that says that we are going to avoid violence against us. Uh, I mean, we come from a long, long, long tradition of people who have been, you know, beaten and tortured and martyred for their beliefs. Um, and so many people in the early church were killed because they wouldn't renounce their beliefs and they experienced uh, profound violence uh, because because of their beliefs. Uh, and so, you know, nonviolence is something that we're supposed to be uh, developing in our hearts. It's not this idea. We don't do it for pragmatic reasons. We don't do it because this is the sure path for peace in my life. Uh, that That's just not the case. In fact, a lot of times what you see is you see, you know, so, so, so much violence of the faith uh, or that, that people of the faith experience has to do with their beliefs. And so you have like these countries who they, they don't allow Christianity in their country. And the Christians in these countries have been oppressed. And part of the reason for that, this is my opinion, is because as soon as you start to have people who embrace these Christian beliefs, part of that is that you recognize the profound dignity and value of each person. And as soon as you have a community of people who knows that they are loved with an unsurpassable love by the creator of the universe, it's really hard to get them to uh, feel small enough about themselves that you can oppress them as easily. And now, you know, with sheer force, you can, but, uh, you know, countries don't like to do that unless they have to. So, um, and so, yeah, I, I think that uh, that's a lot of kind of talking around this important distinction that we are to pursue 
nonviolence without the assumption that we're never going to experience violence. Because a lot of times what we find is that people who pursue nonviolence, a lot of times they agitate people into violence. And so um, and and the cross is just a, another example of that, where it's not that God wanted this to be violent. It's just that he knew it would be. He knew that Jesus would create this violent reaction, and uh, God uses that violence against his enemy and for the sake of his people. That's good, Dan. I don't have anything to add to that because honestly, again, and I remember us having these discussions when we were in the throes of those parts of the series and it is so nuanced. And so there are a ton of like, if you want to call them disclaimers. And so, yeah, like, again, I just want to go back to heart posture. And um, I, I just want to say, yep, this wasn't like God just was bloodthirsty. And so Jesus was the one. Yeah. you know, to pay that cost. That, that's not, that's not really, you know, but you, you explain that very well. I do just want to say, if I, if I were to have a disclaimer, you guys have to know if you've heard us, if you know us, you have to know, we're not talking about allowing yourself to be a victim of abuse. Right. Um, you know, that is not what this is. Okay. So let me just say that. Yeah. And we have talked about that, but again, if someone is hearing us for the first time, please know that is not what we're saying. Like, you know, uh, to be, to be, to willingly put yourself to be a victim of abuse and put yourself in dangerous situations. Um, that's, that's right. That's not this game. So Dan, you have something that you kind of wanted to close out yes. this episode with. And so is this your nugget? Is this yep. like kind of like a, okay. Yeah. You know, I, I just like it. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because like I was reading, uh, some church history and this is from, the Epistle of Diognetus, which I think is in like the year 140 or something like that. So it's like early, okay. early, early church kind of stuff. <laughs> and um, I was just reflecting on just how profound the kind of implications of Jesus's teachings were on these early communities. And Diognetus really kind of, uh, or this epistle to Diognetus really captures uh, these Christian communities and how unique they were. And so I'm just going to read this and, um, and then I'll just kind of end with this. But uh, he says this, for Christians are not distinguished from the rest of humanity by country, by language, or by custom. For nowhere do Christians live in cities of their own, nor do they speak some unusual dialect, nor do they practice an eccentric lifestyle. This teaching of theirs has not been discovered by the thought and reflection of ingenious men, nor do they promote any human doctrine, as some do. But while they live in both Greek and barbarian cities, as each one's lot was cast, and though they follow local customs in dress and in food and other aspects of life, at the same time, they demonstrate the remarkable and admittedly unusual character of their own citizenship. They live in their own countries, but only as aliens. They participate in everything as citizens, and they endure everything as foreigners. Every foreign country is their fatherland, and every fatherland is foreign. They live on the earth, but their citizenship is in heaven. They obey the established laws. Indeed, in their private lives, they transcend the established laws. They love everyone, and by everyone they are persecuted. They are unknown, yet they are condemned. They are put to death, yet they are brought to life. They are poor, yet they make many rich. They are in need of everything, yet they abound in everything. They are dishonored, yet they are glorified in their dishonor. They are slandered, yet they are vindicated. They are cursed, yet they bless. They are insulted, yet they offer respect. When they do good, they are punished as evildoers. And when they are punished, they rejoice as though brought to life. By the Jews, they are assaulted as foreigners, and by the Greeks, they are persecuted. Yet those who hate them are unable to give a reason for their hostility. And uh, I just thought that was a, a profound sort of uh, uh, description of what the early church was like in the world. Um, absolutely, uh, the peace and the love and the kind of autonomy of God's people it causes very strange reactions in the world. And um, 
And I just, I just think that, you know, in, in seeing how, when we've preached about peace and nonviolence and seeing how even, even people who are part of our church react, you can kind of see echoes of this through, throughout history. And I just thought that was a fascinating uh, description. I love that, Dan. Do you want to hold that up for folks in case they well, want yeah, to this go is, grab it? <laughs> so, well, here let me let me just say that this is uh, yeah. the letter uh, or the epistle to Diognetus is only I think it's like sixty pages long, uh, maybe not even that, and it's in this collection, um, the Apostolic Fathers or Apostolic Fathers, uh, and it's by Michael Holmes, who was a professor at Bethel, and um, uh, this collection is, but obviously these writings are from. Uh, you know, the year 75 to like 180. Wow. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah. What There's a cool some resource. really, really good stuff in here. Like, like I was surprised. I thought it would be a lot of just like weird religious mumbo jumbo, but it's, uh, there's some really profound stuff in here. So. Mm. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. And I loved what you read. That was really profound. And what a, what an app descriptor. Yeah of of that time mm. uh I, my nugget is simply to say um uh, don't let this be the end of your journey with sermon on the mount i get it if you need to take a little pause take a little break <laughs> go study some other things of course we hope that you will continue to tune in to woodland hills on the weekends yes. and and jump in this next series with us but circle back to it because this is this is so foundational the themes and the teachings are so foundational and if you're finding yourself as you return back to these passages. If you're finding yourself doing the what abouts, what about this? What about that? Can't I do this? Do you mean that? Um, I, if you need to write those down, write them down, but just like do whatever you need to do to set that aside and then ask the Lord, okay, I'm setting that aside. What are you trying to show me in this? Like, here is my heart, Lord, speak something that I need and, and, and don't, hyper fixate on the whatabouts because a lot of times, not all the time, but a lot of times those are just ways for us to excuse our behavior that we don't want to let go mm. of. And it's a way to excuse those things in our hearts that we want to hold on to that are not fully kingdom. So yep. it's not a judgment. I'm just saying, consider, consider like putting some of that aside and saying, okay, Lord, what is it that you would have me see in this? What is it that I'm not seeing about myself? How have I contributed to this situation or this issue? And how am I harboring? Let's take the violence for, for an example, since that's what we've been on. How am I harboring some of that in my heart and in my life? And he will reveal those things to you. I guarantee it. He will, because he loves us just that much. Yep. That's uh that's really well said. And especially the, you know, we will we'll we will use objections to um avoid confronting the sin in our lives. And that's one thing is, you know, trying to be more nonviolent, it just shows me how violent I am. And it it really reveals uh the actual state of my heart and my spirit. And um, and that's always a good thing. And uh even if I'm not able to, uh, you know, be Jesus like uh, on any of these teachings. At least I will have the humility of knowing where I really am. And uh, mm -hmm. so I think that's a really good teaching. Yeah. Amen to that. All right, folks. Well, that's our show for today. Thanks for tuning in. We will see you in the chat later on. And we really enjoy that. So thank you guys that are able to hop in there and, and connect and engage in that way. Thanks for sending in your questions. We always appreciate them. And just know that if we don't get to your question in a particular week, sometimes we circle back. So never fear. Like don't, it's not for naught. So, um, and come on this next journey with us, Unraveling Truth. It's going to be really good. You're going to hear from a bunch of different folks at Woodland. And um, we, Dan and I, will always be here on Tuesdays to have that discussion, further that conversation about what we're hearing on Sundays. So be sure to continue to tune in. Thanks so much, guys.